Welcome to this uh, presentation. What we'll be looking at today is the development of the GIS and Asset Management Program at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, here, pic uh, in this picture, uh, in uh, showing the uh, flat irons at the back and uh, and the original uh, campus building, which, if we go back, is actually situated uh, in this picture in the background. And so the, um, the, the, uh, this presentation is, is where the data for the GIS is going from 00, zero to the building of an intelligent geospatial inventory uh, set at uh, UCB. The main work was done by Eileen MacDonald, who uh, at the time was the GIS specialist uh, in, at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I am Colin Hobson the Director for Open Spatial for North America. This is campus uh, that you can see in front of you now, present day picture. And let's go back a little bit. Um, in just for the agenda, we'll look at some background, project phases, deliverables, and next steps. One of the challenges was that uh, the original mapping for the campus was done around a 0-0 position, uh, an arbitrary Cartesian grid, uh, and set such that much of the data was uh, in negative space uh, in, in, in each of the different quadrants. To move from that to a good set of reference data, um, a set of, uh, of uh, survey points of known position and description were set up, and then the existing CAD drawings were moved to those positions, and this involved a, a set of warping and and preparation just to get the data into real-world um, survey coordinates such that all could be coordinated. Prior to that, any new data uh, or uh, captured or drawn for the campus had to be retrofitted to the outdated grid, which was not uh, the same in its X and Y scales, and, and as you can imagine, developed a, a set of data that was not that use, useful. The use of these um, survey markers and uh, control points allowed us to then, or allowed the campus then, Eileen, to uh, build out a data set that was referenced. And so from there, you know, looking at each of the markers using uh, city markers, and so the campus at uh, Boulder is actually an integral part of the city itself, and, the, and it has a number of sections with city buildings and housing all around it. The first phase for the GIS was to actually just get the data so it was even usable. And so there was a lot of different data sources from the city, uh, various base maps, from the county, uh, aerial photos, project surveys, uh, also GPS uh, feature collection, um, and then field surveys and various access databases, uh, archive drawings, and getting those to relate uh, to the data set. One of the pilot projects was to use GPS tools to go and build out the uh, light poles. And um, actually, if we switch over to AutoCAD uh, here, we can try that. Uh, try and get to AutoCAD uh, all the way down to, uh, let's see, one of these. All right, that'll do. Um, have a number of, let's go to the Sharpie first. So this is <laughs> one of the tools in the initial phases was the Sharpie map where the boundaries for campus were drawn uh, in a Sharpie on a map on the wall that was used for many years and this we actually put that right into the GIS. Um, and if you look there were uh, many different um, data sets captured um, and pulled into CAD drawings. So for example, here's a listing of the ones that were cleaned up and put there. So exterior lighting uh, is a set of points there, there where we had CAD data. And then that was GPSed as part of the pilot project and loaded into the system to show that you could add attributes and build out real-world coordinate uh, data across the campus. Um, but just while we're here, there's a campus grid. Um, and, and campuses and airports and ports are, are many cities. They have various utilities, uh, for example, compressed air, uh, chilled water, electricity, uh, exterior lighting, fencing, natural gas, and so these are the collection of uh, drawings, so telecoms, 
uh, TV, um, so, um, stormwater, steam, uh, sewer, tunnels. Many of the utilities go within the tunnels. There are access points, etc., uh, and water. So all of these and all these utilities were being managed in multiple drawings um, and as such uh, presented a problem, apart from the fact that there were different zones and different uh, challenges within tracking who was using what zone. And so the Sharpie map was really put into uh, the system such that we could build out each of those zones into uh, on the data that was being captured. Um, one of those being for the grounds and gardens group. Um, they would have they had a map, and here's each of the um, within those broad campus zones. We then had uh, grounds ground panel zones uh, relating to the name of the buildings in those areas, and then within those there was additional information for. Um, specific ground panels within any given zone. So if you're looking at the TF zone here, you could see there's, uh, you know, there's different stuff in each of these zones. And, and all of that needed to be mapped out. So going back to the uh, presentation then, for this pilot project, a uh, base map was built out, poles, poles, uh, light poles were GPS and put into the system. And so we built out a complete GIS system like this um, from that base set of data, but not just CAD drawings. When the data was in CAD drawings, the attributes were only implicit in layers, uh, layer names, colors, and maybe symbols, and some text next to the lines, as opposed to um, this here, when if you go into the system here, now I'm going to show you that data converted into an intelligent data set looks the same, feels the same. However, you can go onto every one of these and um, you can go onto each one of these uh, assets and click on them. So as we uh, zoom in, here's an, here's an area on campus uh, with some intense uh, utilities. So this would be a um, storm pipe and you can show information about that. So we've got the diameter, uh, we pulled out all of the existing information, calculate the length, uh, go and look at something else. So, so take one of these uh, green um, pipes here. So that would be a sewer gravity pipe. It's four inch uh, VCP. And so we pulled out of the layer name that it was pipe four and put that into uh, a diameter column. And so you get to build out and coordinate between all these data sets, also creating a connected network so that this pipe here knows what the start and end nodes are on it, and we build out that information. Um, added additional information like trees, uh, trees with GPS, These are uh, this is an evergreen tree, and then a uh, symbol there for deciduous trees, they're assigned automatically assigned numbers, and information was gathered about their condition, the spread, the height, uh, and the genus and species and uh, tree type. Um, also there multiple departments on campus dealing with facilities uh, management or housing depending on whether you're outside or inside of the uh, various zones uh, which also determine the funding so you keep track of, of that information um, natural gas lines uh, water uh, and then these um, these lines are actually the tunnel structures underneath the ground that you can see so going from CAD directly into uh, this kind of depth of information which is now uh, maintainable, has attributed, was really important. And so as a result of the pilot project, a decision was made to get the Munsis uh, Asset Intelligence product because it was built using AutoCAD and Oracle, or which are things that the campus already had. Um, it is a turnkey solution that uh, was affordable, user-friendly, has out-of-the-box functionality as well as been able to be customized. Uh, supported by the IT group because now instead of having multiple CAD drawings we actually have a single central database which is much more manageable, consistent and can be made available, that data can be made available to various groups. This process involved a whole lot of demonstrations, uh, presentations and showing Munsis uh, as well as Michigan State University uh, showing what they have done with Munsis, giving demos of their GIS uh, built on Munsis and AutoCAD. Uh, within the database. We also, there was a lot of work done by Eileen and others to really keep uh, 
the management and administration up to speed so they could see what this system would be used for, what the benefits were, uh, and, and really worked on, on building that out so that they could realize that this was much better data keeping, it was saving time and, and effort and really uh, in support of better decision making uh, on campus. In terms of project planning, um, that's where Open Spatial came in. And, and we started then really looking at who were the what were the business drivers, what decisions, who were the users, what would they need, and then phasing the project into essentially three phases um, and looking at what data we already had and what specific applications would need to be developed from there. The phases of the project where essentially phase one was CAD drawing preparation to get the drawings ready and migrate that into the GIS, into the uh, geospatial database. Um, that used all the tools for MUNSIS for data cleanup, uh, attributions, and, and all of that. Phase two, we then build on this uh, basis of data to build out the uh, web-based tool for people to uh, look at the data and, and have everyone other than those editing, but all of the consumers in the different departments to look at the data layers and then clean that up and report errors. And so that would be phase two would be web-based GIS deployment. Phase three is, is integrating with other systems like their uh, document management system and then Famous, which is their work order system. Um, and at this point also to move on to the Open Spatial Enlighten uh, viewer. Um, so let's just take a look at some of that. Um, in phase one, uh, got the Munsis products, got the data set up and uh, launched that along with uh, tools for doing GPS data capture in the field and loading that directly into the uh, data set. Um, and so, you know, just building that out such that there's an attributed set of data that can be reported on as a list, as a uh, query of uh, filtered uh, data. On the data migration side, a number of uh, features, actually there's way more than I listed yet, but things like buildings, street edges, sidewalks, uh, the street names, fences, boundaries, um, public land survey system grid, on the utility side, uh, any number of utilities uh, built out with their attributes, building connected networks uh, in the system. For example, uh, you had to be some original CAD drawing uh, data, and you can just, if you just, you know, just to highlight a few of the uh, issues, things like snapping. The, these lines are drawn to the edge of this circle, and so as a result, you really don't uh, have a connected inf uh, data set at all. Uh, lines are broken where there's text. So this pipe here is two line segments. It really needs to be one record with a length that is the full length of it. Um, incomplete if you're trying to do a connected network. Uh, there's no uh, end point on the end of this line and so where does it drain to or from? Um, symbols, breaking line work, for example this valve, pipes coming to the edge of it, they really should be coming to the middle. Uh, such that it snapped and we could do a trace and break analysis through this data. Probably the most important of, uh, factor is also that the attributes are simple text. This piece of text, although we can read it as 24 inch chilled water, uh, it is not associated with this line. So that line does not know that it's 24 inch diameter and so if you had to do a report from this document of give me the total length of uh, chilled water pipes um, or which ones were the return and which ones were the supply, uh, that this one being supply, that one being return, you just can't do it as a report or a listing. You can see it, but you can't do it. Or things like this, where for this manhole, these are the invert elevations. So you'd to know that there's a pipe coming in northeast, south, southwest, and these values. We need to put those as attributes on the object within the database so that we can use that to a, know which ones we have data on, and B, to build out a fully traceable uh, elevation correct attributed network. Just tools like that uh, are supplied within the Munsis product, and so Munsis AI it just eats up this sort of information in, in a, in a world-class, uh, very efficient manner. Here's the actual, here's a screenshot of the, uh, of the data. I showed it to you earlier. But this is now, it looks the same, but it's actually not. The line work is each 
object you see on the screen is in the database as a record and has attributes and has rules that connect and uh, attributes that need to be filled in. So you can click on anything uh, and look at those attributes of it. Uh, for example, there's a, a manhole, there's a tree, um, and I'll highlight those two as we move through the data set. So that tree is the genus and species. If you look at the dialogues for editing stuff, things like drop-downs to, to ensure that there's consistency and data integrity for things like pipe material. So this means that anyone editing data is going to use the same spelling, have the same list to choose from to build out these sorts of attributes for anything on the map. So here you see a water pipe, and it has a start node, end node, uh, and, and, and it's been checked that it is actually in the ground, so there was a whole process for checking uh, that the objects exist in the ground, because just because it's on a drawing somewhere, whether that's paper or CAD, doesn't mean it actually exists. Uh, you need to check that and then flag that, that it has been uh, checked. And so um, I've shown you the system already uh, to do those editing tools. Um, that, you know, was really pretty much a year's work. What we did then went to phase two is to put that data so everyone else could see it. So we had about 100 or 88, in this case it's now about close to 100 peop uh, la uh, logins looking at 130 layers and, and 100, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of objects uh, within that data set. What we found, however, is that people actually wouldn't really, they'd use the web system and that was great, but they were not being effective in, in updating that information. And so we actually decided to print for each of the 14 core utility layers, print a set of map books. So all 47 map sheets, make a, f a hard copy print and give it to the custodian who's out there and let them mark that up. And then take that data and build that back into the utility data set so that we have data that has been checked in the field, that it's verified, etc. And so the web map looks like this, so it's the same data. Uh, but now you can go, anyone can go to a browser, log in, look at that information, get uh, tooltips and information about objects, uh, drill down and actually look into the uh, columns and stuff like that. Uh, here's the ground panels, for example, each of these polygons looking at turf or um, new areas or gravel or any, any kind of that. So the softscapes have been mapped out, also did hardscapes. But what you see on the screen now is the ground panels, as we call them, and all of the different categories are shown in the legend there. Uh, also, signage, uh, putting this, uh, all of these, uh, link it on the map so you could see where they are, what it looks like, what kind of signage. So you've got all sorts of notes for nodes on a signage for parking and directional and buildings and monuments and that sort of stuff. So what we did then was actually create, here's an example of, an ele of the electric uh, utility book. And this was just for getting edits. So there's one page for each of these 47 map sheets. And here's what came back. Uh, this sort of level of markup within each of the uh, utilities. Um, and so people would mark things up. So get within this was taken and put back onto the data. So at that point, you then have pretty much the most uh, up-to-date set of information. So here's another example, and, and here's where actually you find an interesting thing, and that is people were looking at the original as-built. So this here is actually a printout from an as-built, which has been had the diagram cut out of the page and pasted back onto this map to say that's where it is. Now, clearly that's not a good way to go, but it also highlights the fact that if we had access to the as from any one of these objects on the map, which is what we're going to set up in the, in the next phase. So, uh, you know, just this level of detail, getting putting that onto the tunnels, where the pipes are in the tunnels, uh, looking at cross sections, just picking up any uh, information uh, and, and knowing that somebody actually checked it. And so in that way, you can build out uh, a, a detailed data set that's now up to date. So yes, this is this is heavy lifting. This is the work. But you're going to do it once, and after that, you want to have all the systems in place to continue to update it. But you certainly will make better decisions and have access directly to all of the data that you have. So in terms of deliverables for the phase one and two, uh, the ground panels, we use the areas uh, for getting uh, total areas for different kinds of, of, of um, use, particularly turf reduction. There's a uh, for water um, conservation, there's a 10% requirement per year to reduce the amount of grass or turf 
And so to, we could plan that. We could give them actual amounts. We could look at were they in visible areas compared to areas that were more out, uh, out of the way. Uh, campus signage, just getting an idea of the count, the location, the, the condition. Uh, tree species, um, these were GPS and, and used, uh, captured using a range finding LIDAR um, so that we could pick them up very quickly and get height and crown and, um, and position. But there's a, also an issue that the, um, the white ash trees and the emerald ash beetle borer uh, have actually got to campus. And so there was a, uh, there's recently been a study to, to map out where are all of the uh, ash trees so that we can mitigate the damage and get treatment schedules. So there's a map uh, that we produced of the 752 ash trees on campus and also needing to look at where they are in the city. So the GIS there is forming an essential management part to that. Uh, things like um, West Nile uh, virus um, issues with any kind of stationary water and putting those on the map because those needed to be reported to the state and county. Tunnels are a serious uh, challenge. Uh, just mapping them, looking where uh, entry and exit points are for security reasons, also for emergency, uh, and also, um, you know, keeping track. So, uh, had an incident where a fire truck was uh, driving down the uh, sidewalk and collapsed a piece of a tunnel because they didn't know it was there, and they, we didn't have the weight uh, bearing uh, rating there. So using where the map with the tunnels could actually map out where the access points are which do have the weight bearing piece. And then also on an annual basis uh, the facilities have to provide a list of the underground utility uh, asset inventory. It's a simple list, it looks like this, but the improvement as, as to building that data from the GI. So this is a listing of all of the underground uh, utilities uh, by owner, because there's camp uh, city stuff that goes through campus as well, and the length uh, of that particular um, utility on campus used for underwriting and insurance purposes. And that's really where we're, where UCB is at at the moment. Um, establish the vision and, and lessons learned, just build out the mission, keep people focused on why we're doing this, what are the benefits. The decision making and the access to information have been improved greatly. Uh, getting information out of people's heads before they retire and keeping it in the system has also been mission critical. As a project, you really do want to stay on schedule and, and expect the unexpected. What, what happened here is we actually had to go back to paper maps to get people to supply information. They really were not engaged on using redlining and markup on a digital web-based map. We got much more information from paper. So sometimes you have to, you know, use whatever techniques you need to. GPS was being useful too. So for phase three, we're looking at data integration, uh, moving to uh, Open Spatial Enlighten, um, the uh, business intelligence product, and also uh, Mobile, mobile GIS and, and tying in with laptops and tablets, but linking to the uh, document management system, in this case a system called Meridian, such that any asset on the map you can link to and drill down the documents and asbots that go with it, uh, continuing to update layers and getting you know, staff assigned for actually doing these workflows uh, to replace Eileen, who's, who's retiring. So for example, here are some example maps and Enlightened on a, a other campus. Uh, here's a tooltip for uh, as you move your mouse over the buildings, you can see the uh, area usage for that particular building. Uh, also the drill down, and this is how we link to these multiple documents. If you select anything on the web-based map, you can come in and, and say here's one of 49 documents. There's two databases for the building records. There'd be a hyperlink to a document right there. Click on the hyperlink and in the browser opens up the document and you can zoom to and go and check those details. The other part is that anything in, uh, in the system can be shown as, uh, as 3D. So here's Boulder and there's campus. You can see the, the brown roofs. Let's just zoom in and I'll show you a couple of screenshots. Here's that area of utility that we looked at before. The buildings are simple building outlines that have attributes as to how many stories or floors they are. And so they are, their height is extruded out based on that. The trees are actual rail positioned GPS trees and the height and crown is accurate in this model. So what you're looking at is vector data. And if you look a little closer, 
you can see there are the utilities. There's that manhole I mentioned. Here's the tree. The utilities are in place. So the green would be the sewer, and blue is water, and brown is, sto is, is uh, the stormwater, yellow is natural gas. And so let's just drill down to that. Looking at a tree, we are linked live to that same database in, in, in this uh, Autodesk InfraWorks. And so you can look at the genus and species for the tree um, in the system. If I back the opacity of the image, back that off a little, you can look through the aerial photo to the underground uh, utilities and actually zoom underground. And so here you can see where the tunnels are and where those uh, particular things are. There's that manhole we were talking about, and there's the bottom of the end of the tree. So just a whole new world here of being able to view stuff. Also, uh, InfraWorks adds additional value. Not only can you see the utilities, there's the gas lines, here's the stormwater, there's sewer, there's water, but you can put a Revit model in place on the ground and then drill into that. So if I zoom into that uh, building, you can actually hear them inside the Revit model looking out through the window. And so that just gives you an idea of how uh, University of Colorado Boulder went from essentially a set of drawings and manual systems to a complete asset inventory that is now sustainable, updatable, can be used for paper maps on the web browser for new projects, as well as Autodesk InfraWorks uh, in, in, in the powerful way that they've just not been able to do for reporting, for uh, response to flooding, which has just recently happened, uh, the tree uh, issue, um, rehab of, of pipes, uh, connectivity, where does this go? If I dig here, what is there? That sort of uh, question. So just that was just a, a quick overview of the system, and uh, please you know contact us at openspatial.com, and we'd be happy to, to show you more information. Thank you.